All right, um, thanks for coming tonight, everyone. Um, I'm calling the meeting to order. It is May 11th, 2023, 5.34 p.m. Um, and then before we start, there's no one else on the Zoom, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, take roll call. If you're here, please stay here. <laughs> Commissioner Guzman? Here. Um, Alder Hutchison? Here. Commissioner Shelton? Here. Commissioner Vinson? Here. And the ones that I don't see present are Commissioner Greeno, Commissioner Commissioner Kostishka, Commissioner Hassan, and Commissioner Ortiz. All right. Um, so now, um, moving forward, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the agenda for today, May 11th, 2023. Motion second. I'll motion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, All in favor, please say aye. 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 All not in favor, please say nay. <coughs> okay. Agenda stands approved. Um, next, can we get a motion to approve the minutes for a previous meeting on April 13th, 2023? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All non-favor, please say All right, the minutes for um, April 13th are approved. All right, so today is more of an informational session, um, and so we don't have any items to vote on um, for regular business, so we're gonna move on to letter F, which is informational. So um, just a quick rundown of this section. Um, we're gonna have the Fair Housing Center of Northeast Wisconsin share information about their organization and process. And then we'll go forward with um, a chair update from me. And um, and so before I invite our first guest speaker, I'd like to just kind of share a little context behind the housing initiative. I'm not sure how familiar Erica is. Um, and Erica, feel free to unmute yourself and, um, and speak whenever, um, but um, in this past year, we put together a housing report on the housing crisis, the conditions of it. Um, oh, uh, I see Saeed is, pres yep. is present. Okay. Hi, Saeed. Um, but back to what we're talking about. Oh. So, um, the housing initiative, we, we were able to come up with a full report and recommendations for city council to consider. And they passed that on to staff to move forward with um, the the recommendations. So we were hoping to invite Erica here today to learn more about um, their their programs and the processes and if you guys have any questions um, about the, the organization or how to if you have any suggestions on improvements. So John, I don't know if you have any other things to add. No, I've, I've talked to Erica a few times so thank you for being here and I'll, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, first, <laughs> I am so grateful to be here. Um, I must say, this is a little peculiar on my end just because I really can't see any of your faces. <laughs> so if something I'm saying doesn't make sense or if you have questions or comments you want to make, I'm not going to be able to read it on your face. So please speak up. Um, yes, I am familiar with the report you put out earlier this year and was incredibly impressed by the amount of work that had gone into that including the recommendations um, so thank you so much for for all of your hard work anytime attention is paid to housing justice and housing community needs broadly I think uh, we all benefit um, so I'm not sure how much you know about the Fair Housing Center of Northeast Wisconsin um, but I'll give you a brief background um, our parent organization is the Metropolitan Milwaukee Fair Housing Council and I actually am the director of program services for the Fair Housing Council in Milwaukee um, but we also have a satellite in Appleton that serves Brown, Outagamee, Calumet and Winnebago counties and we have a satellite office in Madison that serves Dane County our office in Milwaukee serves the four county metro Milwaukee area and we do work across the state of Wisconsin as our resources permit. Uh, we are a private nonprofit civil rights enforcement agency. So uh, while we contract with different government entities, including the city of Green Bay uh, through the CDBG program, we're, uh, and we get funding from the state of Wisconsin and the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, we are a private entity. Um, we uh, have a two-part mission. First, we work to combat illegal housing discrimination in all its forms across the state. And we work to create and maintain racially and economically integrated living conditions. 
because as I'm sure you all know, we're a very segregated nation and a very segregated state based on race and income. Um, that's certainly true of metropolitan Milwaukee, but places like Green Bay and Madison and La Crosse and Sheboygan and virtually every community has some form of residential segregation. So we take complaints from people who feel as though they've experienced discrimination in the housing market, uh, whether that's when they're attempting to rent a home or in tenancy in a rental situation. We can also assist people who've experienced discrimination in the home purchase process, either when working with, uh, say, a real estate broker or when trying to get a mortgage loan uh, or homeowner's insurance or other things like a fair appraisal for a home or uh, a fair home rehab loan when they're already in a home ownership situation. Discrimination can and does happen in all of those facets of the housing market. Um, we are not attorneys at the Fair Housing Council. We don't provide legal representation for our clients. Our role is to investigate our clients' allegations and gather evidence of discrimination when it's happening to them. And we help keep them informed all along the process of what their options for legal remedy might be, whether that's filing a lawsuit and in federal court with uh, an attorney <coughs> we could refer them to, or filing a complaint with a government agency like HUD or the State Equal Rights Division. We have a really active outreach and education program, so we give presentations um, to all kinds of groups like faith-based groups, religious congregations, um, social service agencies, community-based groups, uh, homeless shelters, you name it. We'll present on this topic to almost anyone, anywhere. Uh, we also provide training to rental housing providers so that the housing providers know what the law is and how to comply with it. Uh, we run a really active fair lending program that works to ensure that all people have equal access to credit uh, no matter where they live. And finally, we have an inclusive communities program which works directly with policymakers and developers and elected officials to ensure that as our communities grow and develop, that they do so in ways that expands housing choices for all people and that really promotes integration. Um, so often the ways in which our, our communities grow only serves to sort of reinforce the housing segregation that already exists. And we need to help communities take deliberate action to promote integration, to break down those historical patterns of segregation. And um, I think I'll close simply by talking about our partnership with Green Bay, which has been going on for many, many years now. We have a $20,000 contract with the city of Green Bay through the CDBG program. Um, that's been true for many years now. Um, and under that grant, we do many of the things I just described. We take complaints, we conduct investigations, we do a lot of education and outreach. Uh, I hope some of you have seen the bus ads. Uh, we spent part of that $20,000 contract trying to raise, a, raise awareness of fair housing issues and the availability of our services on bus ads that appear in, um, I believe, Spanish, Hmong, and English in Green Bay. Um, I will just add a little bit of detail to say that the most common type of housing discrimination take, complaint we take is based on disability. Um, disability complaints are common in Wisconsin and all across the nation, followed by complaints based on um, race, national origin, <coughs> sex, and familial status, which protects families and children from <coughs> discrimination. Um, and I think, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now and open it up to your questions, your comments. I'd love to hear uh, what concerns you in particular about fair housing in Green Bay. So thank you so much, Erica, um, for sharing um, a little bit more about the organization. Um, I'm happy to hear that you guys are contracted again with the city of Green Bay. Um, I know that we have a history with your organization. I think um, one of the questions that I have is, um, could you provide a little bit more of an overview of the process of handling city complaints coming from Green Bay residents? Um, 
How do they submit complaints? Where does it go? How long does it usually take to resolve those complaints? And um, has any of those complaints escalated to um, lawsuits? And then also, can we get transparency in the, into the data of, of all the complaints that have happened um, with the city of Green Bay residents? Certainly. So I'll take your last question first regarding complaints. We submit quarterly reports once we've got a contract fully executed for the year. We submit <coughs> quarterly reports that detail all of that information um, to Krista Cisneros in the CDBG program. Um, and so she could certainly share with you our reports. And in the reports, I've got a recent one here in front of me, we outline the date a complaint was taken, the race or um, ethnicity of the complainants, uh, the gender of the complainants, the income level of the <coughs> complainants, how many people are in the complainant's household, um, and then of course the basis of the complaint, for instance, you know, whether it was based on disability or race or another protected class. Um, so as for our process, um, our process happens in a, in a couple different ways. First and foremost, generally speaking, we have a toll-free statewide complaint intake line. All of our complaint intake happens using the telephone in that way. We will uh, initiate you know, conversations that way. We can, uh, sometimes we get referrals from social service agencies or community groups and so forth. Sometimes the complainant calls us directly. Either way is fine. Sometimes we initiate the complaint intake immediately. At other times we may ask the uh, complainant to fill out a form outlining the general details of their concern and send that back to us and that's how they initiate it. We use that written protocol at times when our complaint levels are through the roof and it's just too much. We don't have the staff capacity to um, engage in intake over the phone which is a little more time consuming. Although once people would return that paperwork to us then we respond via the phone to do a full intake. The intake involves a lot of information um, shared between the, compl the complainant and our staff. We find out the details of what happened to them. Um, did they experience discrimination or are they concerned they experienced discrimination in a single phone call? Or is it an in-tenancy situation where they've had nine months worth of interactions with a housing provider? We get a lot of detail in chronological order about what has happened to them and why they believe it happened to them. Uh, we also take a fair bit of demographic information from our complainants about their household. Um, you know, for instance, things related to their income, their age, the number of people in their household, um, their credit history and income, uh, any employment or other sorts of background like that. I mean, we take a lot of that information so that we can structure an investigation that's going to be meaningful or useful for that complainant. At that point, our complaint process is very client-led. Our clients determine what happens ultimately, ultimately with their complaint. We don't tell them, yes, you should file a complaint with the Equal Rights Division, or you could file a complaint in federal court, or you should file a complaint in federal court. Our role is that we provide our complainants with information about all the options available for them, all those different paths of legal remedy they may have access to. And then they can make their own decision based on that information. You know, they can make the determination about what's best for them and their family. Um, in terms of timelines, you know, how long it, it can take from first taking a complaint to it being fully legally resolved, that varies tremendously. I mean, the shortest could be a matter of weeks if the client is able to, um, with our assistance, advocate for themselves and work out the problem with their landlord. Let's say they've asked for a support animal and the landlord has said no. Oh, I'm sorry. My computer is sending me strange notifications. Um, uh, you know, we can t give people the tools to self-advocate and they can resolve the situation in a matter of weeks. Sometimes if they file a complaint with, say, the Wisconsin Equal Rights Division, it could be resolved in mm, nine to 12 months. 
And in other cases, unfortunately, it can take longer uh, in the court system or at HUD, um, you know, it can take a year to three years, just depending on the facts of the case, um, the parties involved and how much they're interested in negotiating a settlement or how much they're interested in pursuing it all the way to the legal end. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of different outcomes. I'm sorry to say there's no one way that these cases tend to proceed. Um, but yeah, it's um, an interesting path for our clients. Our role again is really to ensure that they uh, have what they need to stick with the process the whole time and um, find the resolution that feels satisfactory or is satisfactory to them. I hope I answered all your questions. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Uh, I have some follow-up questions, but I want to make sure that the other commissioners have a chance to ask questions too. I, I have one. You, you mentioned the, uh, the variation in complaints, the number of complaints. I'm curious, how many complaints do you get, say, in the course of a year? And then is there any seasonality to how it fluctuates over the course of a year? Yeah. So, again, I'll take the second part of your question first. Is there seasonality? Yes, I mean, typically complaints are um, a little bit lower in number in the coldest winter months. There tend to be just fewer people moving than um, but not always. I mean, some years it seems like it's a pretty steady level of complaints year round. Um, anecdotally, we've observed that when uh, there's a downturn in the economy, complaints dip a little bit, in part because people are desperate to get housing and they just need a roof over their kids' heads and they're not going to file a complaint because they just need to hustle to find a place to live. Um, during the pandemic, we saw an increase in specific types of complaints. We saw an increase in complaints based on sex involving sexual harassment during the pandemic. So yeah, there's a lot of variability. Um, I would say, generally speaking, on an annual basis, our organization statewide takes anywhere from 200 to 250 complaints. Um, but it's important to note that that is always going to be an undercount. It's not representative of the real scope of discrimination happening out there. Um, discrimination is often un goes unreported because the way discrimination happens in 2023 is so subtle and very sophisticated <coughs> that many housing consumers leave housing transactions. Um, not knowing they experience differences in treatment compared to someone else and so therefore don't complain about it or people know they experience discrimination or are concerned they are uh, experiencing it but they don't pursue it because as I said they've got to hustle and get a roof over their kids heads or they don't know where to turn or they think that you know it won't make a difference in their lives and so those are a lot of the obstacles we need to address um, to ensure that those complaints come in and that people are able to stand up for their rights. I will tell you specifically about Green Bay. Hold on one sec. In Green Bay in 2022, uh, just for the city of Green Bay, we took 11 complaints, uh, which is a pretty low number, but I think it's reflective of what I just described, that if discrimination is unfortunately really underreported despite our best efforts to get the word out about this issue and, and how people can pursue a legal remedy. Um, I would point out that, you know, we probably take, um, well, maybe close to double that number from Brown County, um, but Green Bay specifically, there were 11 in 2022. That's very helpful context. Thank you. Yeah. Erica, I have a question for you. Um, I'm wondering if these, I know you mentioned that on the buses and the ads, you know, it, it's in different languages, which in a way, I love that because it's equity, right? This is something so everyone can be a part or complain, uh, put their, file their complaint. But my question is, all of these services, do you also provide them in other languages as well? 
like these consults and being able to you know check in or have these meetings yeah so we can offer complaint intake in almost any language using a professional um, telephonic interpreter we contract with an interpretation service that we can call and um, they'll provide real-time interpretation for um, complainants who call us using nearly any language uh, and we have I believe at this point nearly all of our outreach materials um, like brochures and flyers and the like in English Spanish Hmong Somali and Arabic um, Thank so you. yeah and then in terms of presentations um, generally like if we're giving presentations to a group of Arabic speakers mm -hmm. or Spanish speakers uh, we'll work with community members to find someone um, who can be a trusted partner to provide that interpretation thank you Rico that's super helpful and actually really nice and re I get relief from that so it's definitely a, a service that I think more people might not know it's something that maybe more people need to know about as well. Um, another question that I have for you is, um, do you see a pattern in the demographics of the groups or populations that are reaching out some of these services? And finally, with the situation that's happening in Florida, is this something that is only available for citizens or also some of our illegal immigrants? Sure, so um, to your last point, yes, we take uh, complaints from people who are undocumented. Okay. Um, it's a challenge sometimes that um, you know we're very aware that people who are undocumented may feel afraid or concerned about filing a complaint and we understand that um, but we can certainly take those complaints. Um, in terms of your first question, I'm not sure I'm answering it correctly but certainly um, among race-based complainants, most of our complainants are black. Among complainants who um, are filing complaints based on national origin or ethnicity, most are Latino or Southeast Asian. Okay. Can you repeat the first part of your question? Well, I was like, you answered it. Answering it fully. You answered it. Yeah, I was wondering if there was any patterns in the demographics that reach out for services from, from Oh, you guys. thank you, yes. Yeah. So in addition to what I just said, I will say that um, every year it seems roughly 70 to 80 percent of our complainants identify as female. Um, I'm not sure why that's the case, except that um, women are especially vulnerable to housing discrimination and face housing discrimination based on multiple protected classes. Um, and then the other thing I would add is that disproportionately our complainants come from individuals who have low income uh, or sometimes extremely low income. And I want to be clear here, it's not because um, more affluent housing consumers don't face discrimination. There's a saying in the fair housing world that income is no shield because oftentimes black households who are affluent experience discrimination mm -hmm. in sales or lending, um, but they have the wherewithal, the financial wherewithal to take their money and go elsewhere. Um, whereas uh, people who experience discrimination in the rental market have fewer such resources and fewer choices for affordable housing in virtually any community in Wisconsin. Um, so all of this is me trying to say, it's not that people with low incomes experience discrimination and people with more affluent yes. income levels don't. It's that um, folks with lower or moderate incomes recognize it more often and need our services more often. Thank you, Rick. Um I've got a question. Um, be, uh, I think the subtleness of discrimination is becoming an issue uh, because I think there's a lot of people, especially in Green Bay, who don't recognize discrimination uh, for several reasons. Um, but I wonder, is there a pattern in northern Wisconsin uh, where you get, don't get data or, 
or questions or calls versus the more populous cities because of how subtle that discrimination is I, I guess what's your look on that that's a good question and a tough question generally speaking I would say that unfortunately no part of the state has more subtle discrimination than any other. Uh, we see discrimination happening in really subtle, sophisticated ways throughout the places we work. Um, I mean, sometimes discrimination happens in more coded ways or it's coded differently in some areas. For instance, some years ago, maybe some of you are familiar with this case, this might be eight or nine years ago now, um, we had a complaint from a woman named Sheila who was moving to Green Bay from Milwaukee. And Sheila was African American and was moving to Green Bay with her wife and three grandchildren and they were seeking to rent a single family home in Green Bay. And when she called to rent, or she called the, um, owner of the single family home and asked about renting it, asked if it was still available and all those sorts of things. He asked her some questions about herself and her family and where she was moving from. And when she told him that she was moving from Milwaukee, he said, oh, I don't take people from Milwaukee here. Um, well, I mean, I, I don't think it's gonna surprise anyone mm. I'm speaking to that that was a coded way of him declining to rent to someone of color. Um, so, you know, that may be a, a unique way it happens outside Milwaukee is people that, you know, housing providers in Madison or Green Bay may use coded language of that nature. Um, and by the way, I'll tell you the outcome of that case. We, um, we um, conducted an investigation that showed that that housing provider made similar statements to only black people inquiring about that home for rent. And even when we had um, white individuals inquiring about that home for, for rent, also moving from Milwaukee, he made no such statements about not accepting people from Milwaukee. So it was clearly about the race of the home seeker not being from Milwaukee. Um, and that case settled before it reached a trial or an administrative um, law hearing at the state of Wisconsin. Um, the terms of the settlement, the financial terms of the settlement were undisclosed, but I can tell you that Sheila was very, very satisfied with the outcome of the case. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, to your initial question about the subtlety of discrimination, that's one way it can happen in places like Green Bay or other places in the state. The other subtle ways just have to do with things like housing providers misrepresenting what's available, telling you know people of color calling to inquire about apartments, oh sorry, you know, I don't have any more two bedrooms, I just leased the last one. I might not have another one available until the end of the year. Whereas telling white home seekers, oh yeah, we have available units, you know, starting June first, you gotta come see them. You know. If you were the home seeker in that situation who was told nothing's available anymore, what would necessarily make you stop and wonder if other people are being given totally different information? Um, chances are you're not going to stop and wonder. You're just going to move on to the next place on your list to call. Um, and so for that reason, again, housing discrimination is unfortunately underreported. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I have just a couple of quick questions and then a bigger question. Um, <clears throat> you said that you refer people to attorneys. Um, do you have pro bono attorneys that you work with? Like, is income a consideration for folks in this situation? We have a cooperating panel of attorneys, just attorneys in private practice, who agree to take our referrals on a contingency fee basis, meaning they don't get paid unless their client wins. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then you talked about the fair lending program. Does that mean you actually offer credit or is that a like an investigatory kind of uh, program as well? The latter. It really works to ensure that banks are 
living up to their responsibilities under the Community Reinvestment Act, that they are providing credit in all neighborhoods uh, for things like home rehab loans. Because historically, you know, financial institutions disinvested, um, particularly in minority concentrated neighborhoods, and we're working to reverse that so that that kind of credit is available to all homeowners and home seekers. Yeah, great. Um, and then um, I assume you get resistance from landlords in these investigations unless there's some kind of, unless you take it to another body that can kind of compel them to participate? So um, I'm not sure I understand the question fully, except I will say that our investigations are covert. Um, oh, I see. The housing okay. provider isn't aware that we're conducting an investigation until after the, the investigation has concluded. Um, and then, um, yes, sometimes when we're assisting a client, either you know preparing for a trial in state or federal court or pre preparing to engage in the administrative hearing process, housing providers will try to discount the evidence our investigations have uh, yielded. But our investigations remain really powerful in that you know, they provide the sort of objective third-party evidence um, that really elevates the situation from being just something where it's one person's word against another's. The sorts of evidence um, we're able to collect is really compelling to judges and juries, administrative law judges, and so forth. Thanks. No, that's helpful. That's, that, that, that answers the question. And then uh, last question, which is, you know, you talked about how many uh, instances there are of people probably not reporting what's going on. If, if money was no object, I mean, obviously, if money was no object, we wouldn't have probably have this situation. But if money was no object, what, what do you think would be um, the most effective way to encourage people to actually complain when it's time for them, when they need to complain about some of these things? And, then, and I'm just, and I'm, I mean, I'm really just kind of brainstorming here because we're thinking about this question. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, a few different things. I mean, certainly we could double, triple, quadruple our outreach and education efforts um, to make sure that every housing consumer is aware of not only what their rights are, but what the red flags of illegal housing discrimination are, that they understand their right to pursue a complaint and then to make it as user friendly as possible to pursue a complaint. Um, I know you referred to systemic investigations in the um, report you put out earlier this year. I mean, in the absence of people who are able and willing to file complaints, those sorts of systemic investigations can be tremendously powerful in uncovering patterns and practices of um, systemic discrimination happening in a housing market. And those are cases in which um, you know, the city of Green Bay or the Fair Housing Council could have legal standing to bring action, um, even if there's no you know, individual bona fide complainant involved. <coughs> the other thing that sometimes can occur and could be helpful in a community where complaining or complaints are underreported in general is that you know many organizations in the community, private organizations themselves could have legal standing to file complaints. For example, um, if a disability rights agency has as part of its programming and its mission to help their clients find and keep stable housing, and they're finding that their mission is frustrated um, by the presence of ongoing discrimination against people with disabilities in the market, yeah, they may have legal standing to bring a complaint against, uh, say, a large apartment management company or something like that. That's really helpful. Thank you. So I do have three or four more questions, but I see that we have two commissioners online, um, Commissioners Hassan and Commissioner Ortiz. Do you guys have any questions for Erica? Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the information. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, for, for providing me, uh, for giving me this role. Uh, one thing I wanted to uh, ask is, in the case of refugees and migrants who are in the country less than a month, and they oftentimes get denied access to housing, 
due to uh, you know unavailability of central history or environment history. Does that warrant complaint? That's my first question. Second question is you mentioned that uh, those uh, materials that are on the bus for you know further furthering the um, the message out or taking the message out. You mentioned that it's uh, Spanish and, uh, and, and English. You know, do you have the ability to also add other languages that are like spoken in the country? I mean, in, in, in Brown County, including Somali, uh, you know, I am Dari, Pashto, and Russian, because we do have those community members uh, in the community as well. So those are two. I think one is, com one is uh, yeah, I think those are two questions. I want to no. ask. Specifically to your point about bus ads, and yes, in theory, we could absolutely place ads, um, and I'm glad to get your input because it's helpful to know what languages would be most helpful in any given community. Um, and that is why, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our outreach, like printed flyers and brochures, um, are available in Somali and Arabic as well as Spanish and Hmong. Um, but we are always interested as our funding permits to add more languages. The amount of bus advertising um, money in our budget is $5,000, which um, isn't nothing, but uh, you may be aware that it doesn't take you that far in the world of bus advertising. Um, so, you know, we, we pick and choose carefully what we place on buses. But I'll take that into consideration the next in the next grant cycle when we need to sign another contract with the metro system. So thank you for that. Um, your first question about recent immigrants and refugees, this gets difficult. I mean, if the housing provider is intentionally demanding a rental history or credit history or employment history from someone who's a recent immigrant or refugee, because they want to exclude people based on their national origin, that could be a violation of the law and warrant a complaint. However, if housing providers are asking that background information of all applicants, you know, they demand that every applicant uh, provide a rental history and provide a credit history, um, then it may not be in violation of the law. One thing we talk with housing providers about and we talk with um, refugee resettlement agencies about is, you know, are there alternative paths forward? Can a situation be worked out where the refugee resettlement agency perhaps acts as a co-signer on a lease? Or is there another third party that can act as a co-signer on a lease? Um, so when I guess this is my long way of saying when those calls come to us, We'll take a very close look at them on a case-by-case -case basis and try to tease out what's happening. Is this a housing provider who is, you know, working to exclude people based on national origin? Or is this a housing provider who may be willing to negotiate an alternative way to uh, work with someone? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, great sense. Thank you so much. Commissioner Ortiz, I think you had your hand raised earlier. Yeah, and um, I want to apologize that I uh, joined the, the meeting a little bit late, but from your experience and perspective, what are uh, some best practices that can be implemented to prevent um, you know, or to make discrimination uh, practices a little bit harder, right? You know, in our report, we recommended, for instance, education, workshops, um, you know, but but I, I wonder if you can share, if you haven't done that, and again, I apologize, I was late, uh, what a, a body like ours can recommend uh, as, as measures that that will 
you know, prevent certain discriminatory practices. Mm -hmm. um, a few different things, some of which, as you said, were mentioned in the report from January. I mean, certainly um, making available more education to housing providers. So again, they know what the law is and how to comply with it. Um, many housing providers are very familiar with the law, but many aren't. They really have no idea that these laws even exist. Um, there's a lot of variability in the education level of housing providers, and if we can make it more consistent among all housing providers, I think that can only be a good thing. Certainly bringing more enforcement actions, vigorously enforcing the law through investigations and pursuing complaints matters because every time one of those settlements gets publicized, other housing providers in the market sit up and take notice and think, oh wow, you know, I'm going to make sure now that I'm in compliance with the law. Um, I can't remember if this was in your report or not. But one of the things some communities consider is some form of rental housing provider certification program or licensure program. You know, cities like Minneapolis, for instance, have a housing provider registry that housing providers need to be part of in order to do business in, in rental housing. Um, and then, of course, the other thing to consider, and I know Green Bay actually did this fairly recently, but Lots of communities have their own fair housing ordinances with additional protected classes. And of course, I'm well aware that Green Bay, what was it, two years ago, added gender identity and gender expression and so forth, which is fantastic. And the more broadly applicable the law can be, I think the better, the more it affords people equal housing choices. Um, but of course, um, use of housing choice vouchers wasn't made one of the new protected classes and that's an ongoing housing obstacle i think you you probably all know that right now in wisconsin only milwaukee county dane county and the city of madison offer legal protections for people who use housing choice vouchers um, and so that's something green bay could continue to consider going forward that i think um, and protect the rights of many of our most vulnerable community members. So I have like six questions that I came up with, but I'm gonna ask um, two of them right away um, just because it connects with this, and then um, I'll ask the other ones as it comes. But so um, for the training that you provide housing providers, um, is there cultural competency and diversity training provided, or what type of training is that? Um, no, we don't do broad cultural competency training just because that's better done, I think, by agencies who specialize in that. I mean, that kind of training is incredibly important, um, but it's just not our area of strength or expertise. Our training really focuses in on local, state, and federal fair housing laws. We describe all of the protected classes, uh, that local, state, and federal fair housing laws <coughs> contain, and we describe all of the specific types of practices that are prohibited by those laws. Um, and then we go through housing providers or move with them step by step through every stage of a housing transaction. So from the point at which you're advertising a property to the point at which you're ending a tenancy what are all of the fair housing implications of each of those stages? So that's really where we focus. Um, and then we sometimes, depending on the audience and its needs, sometimes we will have trainings for housing providers that focus in on uh, a specific set of topics. So for example, the topic of reasonable accommodations and modifications for people with disabilities is always um, a topic that housing providers are really interested in. Sometimes we've had trainings that focus on sexual harassment in housing situations. And lastly, some of our trainings have focused on hate incidents in housing, um, as hate incidents have been on the rise all across the country, but in Wisconsin as well. We're very concerned that when hate incidents or hate crimes happen, um, they're happening at or near the places people live and therefore are fair housing issues. I am putting my um, 
cell phone number, my direct cell phone number, and my email um, address in the chat. And you're welcome to reach out to me anytime after this meeting if you wanted to have further conversation. Great, thank you, Erica. So um, my next question is, so I understand that you guys reside outside of our city. You're, you're with the Northeast, um, I forgot what it was called. Sorry, excuse me. Um, with the, let me see here, the Fair Housing Center of Northeast Wisconsin. I'm not sure where that's located, but then the parent company is in, or organization is in Milwaukee. So um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about localization, um, making sure that we have a, pre making sure that your organization has a presence in our city. Um, is that something that your organization has talked about or have you collaborated with anyone in here to provide some more training and then, um, it, you know, <coughs> The majority of our residents here who are from marginalized communities, they work odd hours and so sometimes the phone conversation during work days is not always the best option for them. So for me, I, you know, it's, it'd be, for my, our communities, um, it'd be more helpful to have people who are present and local and can meet in person and can be more present. Um, you know, with your organization, have you guys had those discussions? Yeah, it's an ongoing conversation we have all the time. Um, so in our Northeast region, um, you know, we spend some of the funding we receive from the state and federal government on our work in, in the four county area I mentioned earlier, Brown, Kelly, Met, Adobini, and Winnebago. And we also contract with, uh, in addition to the Green Bay CDBG program, we have contracts with Nina, Oshkosh, and Appleton CDBG programs. And right now, you know, the, the preponderance, the, the vast majority of that CDBG funding in this four county region comes from those Fox cities. And that's why we've elected to have our office there, which doesn't mean we would never have an office in Green Bay. It's just explaining why it's shaken out the way it has so far. Um, but you know, we work really hard to be physically present in Green Bay as much as we can. Um, one of my, my staff members just participated last week in a resource fair. I don't remember which one, forgive me, but she was physically present at a resource fair. Uh, we give uh, you know, in-person presentations in Green Bay. In 2022, I think, I'm looking at my notes here, our presentations happen to, among others, the Aging and Disability Resource Center, Brown County, and the Green Bay Housing Authority. Um, but yeah, to the extent we can, we work really hard to have that physical presence there. Um, and certainly when people, as I mentioned, most of our complaint intake happens over the phone. We would certainly meet with someone in person if there were extenuating circumstances, say someone had a disability or they needed for, you know, to share a lot of paperwork with us in person. Um, and of course, we always, when we are working with clients, we're willing to schedule intake calls and so forth outside of typical business <coughs> hours. So, you know, if someone's available at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. instead of during, you know, 9 to 5, that's A-OK -okay with us. Great, thank you. And then, um, has your organization thought about having office hours in Green Bay, collaborating with an organization here and being here for a day or two, or? whatever that would look like um, just so that community members can come and get some consulting done so we've tried that in the past in a bunch of different communities including madison green bay appleton part of the difficulty is that oftentimes the conversations people are having with us are quite personal and private and so it can feel a little challenging to have those conversations when we're like outstationed at another organization. Um, and sometimes the conversations, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes the intake conversations are hours long if we're getting a lot of information from someone. Um, again, it's, I'm never, I'd never say never. If we could find a way to do it that worked well and that really did provide access to people that they wouldn't have otherwise, I'd be all about it. It's about the details. I think we'd have to work out to figure out what um, would make best use of our clients' time and our staff time. That's great. And then, sorry, promise, last <laughs> question I have. <laughs> That's kind of off topic, but um, so I, earlier you um, mentioned that your clients um, or the people that um, come to your organization that 
some of them are able to self-resolve the issues. Do you have like the, the numbers or the, the data for that? How many people do resolve it without taking it into, in, or without having a lawsuit? How many are, how many are they, how many people are able to just settle it themselves without further support? That is a good question, and I don't have the answer at my fingertips. I'm looking in my report from Green Bay at the end of last year. It doesn't describe the ratio. I would say it's a minority of our clients. Like, I'm thinking, you know, under 20%. It, it varies. You know, if it's a race discrimination case where someone feels like they were discriminated against because they're black, Chances are high they're not going to want to go back and negotiate with that housing provider and put themselves in a vulnerable position of being discriminated against again. The types of resolutions I'm talking about, uh, clients working out on their own, tend to be in tenancy where they already have like a relationship with the housing provider. And it tends to be when they are negotiating for something like being able to live with an emotional support animal or a service animal or negotiating for the right to have, you know, grab bars put in their shower stall, things like that. All right, thank you, Erica. Do we have any other questions that um, we'd like to ask Erica? Otherwise, we do have her contact information too, so we can always reach out to her. Any further questions? If you're willing to share, uh, how did you come to this work? <laughs> it was an accident, really, and yet I have been with the Fair Housing Council for 25 years, so clearly it was a happy accident. <laughs> this sort of justice work, you know, gets in your bones, and you just, um, it becomes, you know, a personal passion, a, a mission, and so forth. No, I was in graduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm unhappy in graduate school and working and yearning for work that felt more concrete, more um, uh, more tangible to me somehow, and so I ended up here. I will say, you know, anytime you'd like me to come back to Green Bay, I'd be happy to meet with you in person at a future meeting if you develop, you know, future questions or topics that you might want to discuss for possible collaboration. Um, I'd be happy to come in person too. All right. Well, thank you so much, Erica. Um, I just want to say how much we appreciate your time um, presenting information and answering our questions. I know we threw it a lot at you today, but you handled it so well. Um, and so, um, with that being said, I um, was wondering earlier too, you mentioned another representative that handled the reports that your organization puts together. Could you also provide us with that, with her information? Or if you'd like, we can come, come to, we can email you and get that information. Mm -hmm. What would be the best process for that? I'm putting, it's Krista Cisneros. She's in um, the Community oh. Development Black Grant Program at Green Bay. I just put her name in the chat. Okay, perfect, I don't have Thank her you. contact information at my fingertips. No, but she should okay. have all our reports. Awesome, okay. Um, but yeah, and then the last thing I'd like to share with you, Erica, is the, the representative that um, we nominated from the ERC to uh, monitor the housing um, recommendations that we provided with, is uh, Commissioner Shelton. So okay. he, um, I'd like to ask Joe to connect you with um, John and you guys can introduce each other and follow up with each other if you guys have any questions. So Thank I can, you. I can just send her an email. Okay. Perfect. Sorry. I, I wasn't sure what to share all there either, but it's okay. Yeah, sure. Mm. All right. If we don't have anything else, um, Erica, thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Any other discussions on that topic before we move forward with the next item, which is the chair update? Very helpful. Helpful? Yeah, yes. I think there it was, was excellent. Yeah. Uh, so it was it was great listening to her. Yeah. Very informational. 
Um, and of course we have the notes that will be put in the minutes, but I also took my own too. Um, if you guys have any pressing notes or anything that is like hard hitting, feel free to share it with us. Um, but all right, so if there's no further discussion on that topic, I'm gonna move forward with the chair update. Um, so recently I've received multiple notices from various communities regarding um, concerns around the school districts, um, I believe it's not schema plan, um, to close schools due to a bu budget deficit. And so um, as a result of that, I asked the community members to um, come and speak on, on that topic and situation um, so that we can be a little bit more well informed. Um, so I'd like to ask for a motion to open the floor um, to have those guest speakers. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 I mean, aye. I said aye. <laughs> All not in favor, please say aye. Okay, so the floor is open. Um, at this moment, I'd like to invite guest speakers to speak um, about the schema, just the school district schema. And if you can please um, state your name and then um, also which city you're resident of or which district, if you know. My name's Juliana and I am in 54302. I don't know who my district is. <laughs> oh, Iliana Herrera Flores, okay. 2711 Montfort. Yes. Sorry. And I'm with Northeast Wisconsin Latino Task, um, Latino Task Educational Task Force, sorry. Put that one there, Newlet as well. Um, I'm raising concern about schema 12 and its equity and the way it was communicated to the families, the parents. Um, some teachers don't even know that it's happening either. We've gotten those reports. Um, the proposal was by Green Bay Area Public Schools. It was done without, like I said, proper representation, communication. Um, when we were listening to the consultants tell us all about what they were proposing, all they kept saying, this is about the brick and mortar. This is about the brick and mortar. We didn't look at this. We, it's not about that. But what is a community? What is education? It's not brick and mortar. It's the people that are in the schools and the people that, like students, teachers, officers. So why wouldn't you look at that as well? And they haven't given any us any of that information either. So we're also just asking um, to check in on that as well. You know, it doesn't seem like it was done with a fair and equitable lens. Um, and I do have some facts on here too that I would like to say that our Latino population just keeps growing. We are here. We're going to be here. We're not moving to the outsides of the city. Other um, races are mostly Caucasian. We are here. Black and brown communities are going to be left with only Edison School near us. Edison to Washington is, I believe, over 3.5 miles. So that already knocks you out of the two mile limit if you have to take transportation. So um, if you live next to Washington, now you have to go to Edison, you're gonna have to walk. If your parents work for shift, you're probably not gonna be able to make it. If your parents were poor like mine, I am so poor, however, um, you probably won't be able to make it. You won't qualify for transportation because you're outside the limit. But they haven't even told us that those limits might change. You know, which it's okay if it will, but um, they're almost kind of just like, we're closing this, but they're not giving alternatives to the communities that are gonna suffer the most burden from it. Because um, that's, um, sorry, just kind of knew at this, but. You're great, this is really helpful. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so those are some of our main concerns. Obviously there is a lot more as well going on with that. But we were just hoping to get a little extra help on seeing how it can be done in a fair way for us as well. Because um, I do believe that the Green Bay Public Area Schools are 60% diverse, 40% um, Latino. And the task force was only 4% diverse with one black and one white and one uh, Latina person. So, and when we went to these meetings at the beginning, they were just, you know, watching sessions. So it's not like you could even ask questions to the task force. That was also the task force was, we don't know how it's created 100%. So it's like, did they ask the community members that are gonna be most affected? Um, so that's also another concern. And then, um, let me see what else was I looking into here. Sorry, I have a lot of notes. <laughs> 
Um, and I do have some maps as well if you guys want to look at them because one of their other things that they kept saying is, well, we don't want kids to cross the street from Washington to Joanny's. And I'm like, but you would rather have them walk like the bar line here? Um, so it's just like, oh, and it's about the green space. Well, we've never had green space. Why didn't you fix our school long ago? I went to Washington Middle School. I turned out all right, a little nervous, but good, you know? And I don't think it's fair to say, oh, that's a bad school. If we get rid of it, the reputation will go away. No, the reputation will continue with it. It might go to Edison, and then what? Um, all the inner city kids are at Edison, you know what I mean? So it's just, um, I don't see any other way about it that it wasn't there. I don't think that they even bothered to care about our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you guys do want to look at Matt's mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Can I ask a question? I mean, so first of all, thank you for this. Um, my daughter goes to East High School. And, you know, so I drive, she walks sometimes, but we're a little too far away for her to drive every day. But you know, every day we drop her off at school, drive by Washington, see all the kids going to East. And you know, I think about as a as a parent, um, you know, our kids went to middle school at Aldo, and we like lived in that neighborhood because we knew our kids could walk there, right? So I would imagine that a lot of families in that area are thinking we're living here because our kids can go to Washington and then they can go to East, mm -hmm. and you know, especially with you know, a lot of families where you have older kids taking care of younger kids, like knowing that you have the schools rooted in that community seems really, really important, right? Definitely. Culturally, our families take care of each other just like many others as well. However, our parents um, make us the, the oldest Latino be the next parent as well. So then that will also impact their cult, um, like their after school activities and everything. They won't be able to be involved in it because they'll be on the bus so much longer if they get it um, as well. So, yeah. So, a couple of questions. Um, is, is this primarily about Washington Middle School or are there other schools as well? There's others as well. It's okay. Washington Tank and Doty, I believe, are the main ones that are affect our communities. Um, I also have a graph on my phone about all the schools that qualify for free and reduced lunch and the majority of those schools are the ones that will be closing with the most population that does qualify for that. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, did you see, I, I understand that you were mentioning something, do you know why they're going to be trying to close some of these schools? Like, is that an understanding that if you feel the like community has been told correctly or you feel like you were explained like correctly and fairly? No, I don't believe we were explained correctly and clearly. They gave us three handouts at this meeting, both of them. They only had three handouts. And community members had to create their own information sheets. Were they had this one from a teacher. It was only in English. So a map, list of the schools closing, and a flyer. Not in Spanish, not provided in Spanish. Um, and the reasons that they give about it closing is some of them are like, oh, they're too old. And the low EA scores, however, I believe five out of the 10 top schools have high EA, score, EA scores, but they're still closing those. Mm -hmm. uh, low enrollment, however, the east side it has higher populations and higher enrollment. We're not going anywhere. So the east side is, all, is not suffering from the low enrollment? Is this a? That's a fact I don't know. I don't want to lie to okay. you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but yeah, they keep mentioning also like older buildings and then I looked into the day East is older than Washington. Um, for me, it's like looking at the brick and mortar of it is dehumanizing education instead. And it's like they don't want to invest in us either. So, so what could we do that w would be helpful? Like what are you asking for? Are you asking, I know there's a school board meeting coming up yes. on June 5th, right? Where this is going to be voted on essentially. Yes, on June 5th. Well, I'm not sure what you all can do. So I'm just here to ask for help in any way to either um, if you can maybe check if their process was done correctly or see what other options there are, you know, um, 
or maybe even give them tips on how to go ahead and do right. it or right. be show up to the events. May 24th, there's also a forum at Washington at 4 p.m. I would invite all of you to go on May 24th so that you can see as well from the community and um, the presenters. Okay. So I, as, as an individual commissioner, right, I can do whatever I want, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what would be, like, are you, do you want them to delay the decision on June 5th for more, to have more conversation? Do you want them to vote it down? Like, what, what was, what's the outcome that you would like to see happen right now? I think it's a, um, what you said first. It's definitely about um, giving us some time to let the community be aware of what all this means in our language, I suppose, and sharing it because even, um, I believe we were, um, some black families don't even know about it either, and that's not the language barrier. That's just the school not communicating enough to the communities in general. So I would like it for it to be postponed, given um, in the correct information um, informed to the public as well, more of it. Um, they didn't give us a list of where all the money was going either at this meeting, so that was really interesting because they want to invest, I believe, over $7 million in Southwest, but less than uh, 100000 on, on Preble and West. So. Right, is somebody else here to talk about the same topic? Yes. Who is okay, that? and then I'll have Grazia yes. come up here. Thank you, Leanna. Thank you, Leanna. Thank you, Leanna. Good job, by the way. Yeah, you did yeah, great. Thank you so much. How are you? Thank you for allowing us to talk. I also am a member of NULET, which is the Northeast Wisconsin Latino Educational Task Force. And it's an organization that was created out of four of the Latino organizations in our community, which is the Latino Prof uh, Professionals Association, New Latinx Rising, Casa Alba, and Voces de la Frontera. So we have several organizations. Uh, thank you so much for being here, but before you begin, I'm going to ask you to state your first and last name, and then if you can spell that out, um, we'd like to have that um, on record. Okay, I'm Grazia Villarroel, it's G-R-A-T-Z-I-A B-I-L-L-A-R-R-O-E-L. -R -R -E Beautiful. Grazia <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I, I'd like to start off by saying, uh, I think Ileana expressed very much the feelings that the community has, and uh, definitely I think what we're seeing in Green Bay is uh, it's it's one of the communities that's really seeing this man majority minority trend that is going throughout the country but we're seeing it probably before a lot of other communities and I think in this way we're almost like a pilot of what can happen and what can be a good thing that happens so what has happened is if you look at the new statistics you will see that Green Bay is the number one most diverse district in Wisconsin I mean it's it's amazing but I mean it is the most diverse district in Wisconsin period and it's hard to see I mean we've looked at it we've had other people check on it it's definitely like the case so for a small community like this one it's really important I think that the school board realize what that means and what it means in our community as Ileana said is that 60% of the population is diverse and 40% um, of the population is white so you have this uh, th this this uh, breakdown that is really probably going to happen in other communities but it's happening here right now um, so what what it's what has happened with the Green Bay Public Schools is that when they created the task force, um, and they created it in January, they did not provide any demographic information. So to, to be fair to the task force, the facilities task force members, they had no demographic information. And truly, in order to know what each school is like, you would have had to do an analysis of it. And the reason I had a lot of analysis of this is because I was writing an article about our majority minority community. Uh, and I, the Green Bay School District has the, the data. It's just that they did not provide it. And so I think one of the things that happens is that um, if you look then, if you, if, you, if you look at the schema that was provided, can I borrow the schema? Because it's so complex. <laughs> I had to spend hours reading this in order to understand it. And I'm a professor at Saint Over College. Um, it's really hard to understand. It, it's a schema. This is 12.1. They have 12 of these schemas, all really complex. In order to even understand the schema, I had to take pictures of each one of them, you know, make it bigger, start at writing the numbers. It took me hours to do it. So anybody just being handed the schema could never understand the magnitude of what's being done. Um, and the magnitude of what's being done is that a lot of the more impoverished schools are, be, you know, the ones who that qualify for a school lunch or the more diverse schools are being closed. Not all of them, but the majority of them are. And they are being 
bust everywhere. On the east side, there are like 50 moves that are being done. And unnecessarily, because the argument that is given by the consulting firm is that, um, number one, the, the population is declining, which is true overall, but not true for our community and certainly not true for the Latino po uh, population. Um, then they're saying that there's gonna be a budget deficit of 15 million. And then the third one is that the facilities themselves need work. So they were choosing based on which facilities need work. But as we know, we have uh, schools like East High and West High that are really old buildings. They were built in the 1800s. And if those can work, almost anyone can work. It's how much you want to you know, build or remodel them. And truly, they should have been remodeled all along if they had children in them, right? There's, there, there's no, no, it's no excuse to say suddenly we have schools that are really bad and now we have to close them. So just to, to let you know that um, NULA it's specifically, we're concerned about several aspects of schema, 12.1, um, and I will let you know what, what they are. But we, what, you know, in response to what you said, what we want them is to stop the vote because there was not enough representation in the facilities task force. We want them to really have representation and let people know let uh, all the people know in the community what's going to happen before they move on with this uh, plan because it's so monumental. And then the last thing, of course, is we want them that when, to, to make sure that they have an equity lens when they develop any type of schema that they will then vote on and pass. So those three things we really want them to do. Um, uh, more specifically, the Newlet group specifically is concerned about several aspects of this, but we're concerned about Washington, Doty, Tank School, and then we're also concerned about the whole idea of moving boundaries west. And why are we concerned about that? Moving boundaries west is what it's doing is it's making sure that we keep the west side alive by uh, moving kids, by busing kids to the west side to keep it alive because the population of the west side is declining, the schools are under enrolled, and the reason for that is because the west side doesn't have any place to grow. It's surrounded by, you know, Schwabenon, Hobart, so people go to other schools, and, and so it's, it's more integrated than the, than the east side for sure, but it's, it's declining. So we've seen that the, pop, the white population of the Green Bay Public School District in general has declined significantly since 2000. So I have compared 2000 with 2022 and what you see is that it went from 15,000.7 it's now 7,000 so it's almost like cut in half and then the Latino population on the other hand went from 1,600 to almost 6,000 so it has tripled in size it's grown by 300 percent so when the, the Latino population hears uh, that the population is declining and we see the schools are full to the capacity we see that at Casa Alba every day new people are coming and in the medical places where we have also Latinos Latino doctors and they tell us we, we see new people every single day. It does not resonate for the Latino population. Um, so that we're really concerned about those schools, but that we are specifically concerned by the fact that demographic um, information was not provided. It really makes a difference because what do you see? For example, Doty is the only majority Latino school that is um, in Alloway. And a lot of the kids who are coming from, out, from Doty are doing well. They have good academic scores. Some of them are at St. Norbert. I'm a professor there, and I see them at St. Norbert College. Um, but now they want to close it, and, and they're not just closing it and saying, okay, they're all going to go to Langlade, because that's the one that they'll keep open. They're closing it, and only a portion of them will go to Langlade. The rest will go to Eisenhower. They're, and that's like going past two, three schools to send them to Eisenhower, which means they're going to have to take buses to go to Eisenhower. Um, the other one is Washington, Washington Middle School. They want to close Washington Middle School. And I just want to remind people that when we talk about Latino, usually in the Latino schools there's also, you know, black population and Asian populations because it's diverse, right? And so we're talking right now about Latino, but it usually it means it's very diverse. So what happens to Washington? They're going to close Washington, and again, a portion of them will go to Langlade and a lot of them will go to Edison. So we were wondering who's going to be sent to Edison, right? Um, and so what happens when they go to Edison, what, then what do you have with Schema 12? You have between the north, like if you take 172 and you say, uh, let's take 172, and everywhere north of 172, uh, south of Bay Beach, west of I-43, and east of the Fox River, that whole square, there's only one middle school and it's Edison. And there used to be two because it was Washington. Now there's only one. 
and that one school is supposed to kind of receive Edison, but they're going to take some kids from Edison and put them in, I think, McAuliffe or some other place. But in a sense, it looks like segregation, right? I don't think that was the intention at all because they didn't have that information. But definitely there's something going on. And, and what's really hard is because the consulting firm said that what's really desirable today in education is K through 8. So what does that mean? K through 8 means that you're going to get K through 8s for Da Vinci, because Da Vinci is going to move to Webster. Then you're going to get a K through 8 in Langlade. And then you're going to get a K through 8 in uh, um, McAuliffe. And then you're going to get a K through 8 in Redsmith. So it's kind of surrounding the east side. But all of those schools have either 67 to 75% ma uh, white majority. So the, all the white schools are getting K through 8s. But in the big square that I just mentioned, there's only Edison, which now is going to be overly crowded. So we're saying, well, how can that be? You know, how did this just come up with this? And how could anybody who proposed a schema not think that those children also needed K through eights? But what's even worse is when the survey was done, there was a survey done that, by the way, has its own problems. Um, they, they, they literally asked, would you support getting K through eights if we close Washington Middle School? But guess what? The kids from Washington Middle School, most of them, especially the Latino kids, are probably not going to get a K through eight at all. And, uh, and that is problematic. Um, I think the other, the other piece uh, of it, and I'll go to the third school, which is Tank, and then I'll talk about busing, which is the other piece that we're concerned about. So the other school is Tank School. So one of the big uh, arguments they give about Washington is they say Washington is a school that doesn't have green spaces, even though there are a lot of, even locally we have very successful urban schools like Da Vinci and Aldo Leopold. Um, but then also they say uh, it doesn't have um, you know, green spaces and it also has roofing problems and it also has some nicks and crannies where the kids can hide and that's problematic. So the roofing problem, when they did the referendum just in November, they asked for $92 million, $94 million to fix the roof of, of West and of Washington. I mean, that was the Green Bay Public Schools asked for money for those, for those repairs. And then fixing nooks and crannies, it's called drywall. You, 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 you just drywall them and you fix them. It's very cheap to do that. It's not a big deal if that's a big issue. So it's not, it, it, this was planned. I mean, they were planning on doing the roof and they were planning on fixing the nukes and crannies. I mean, they were planning on doing a lot of uh, things to, to ask for so, so much money from the community. The referendum did pass, correct? Yeah, it did pass. So How much? I think it was 92 or 94 okay. million. It was very much a, a big amount. That, and the, the arguments, if you look at the videos, they, it was all about saying we're going to make all these repairs, they need them, et cetera, et cetera. But going back to Tank School is that Tank is a little elementary school, and I always say that. What else do the children in that neighborhood have except their school? It's the only school that has an African-American um, principal, and ideally what we want to see is a lot more representation from diverse communities and diverse leaders in those schools. And Tank's Tank School, the Tank School is under-enrolled like every West side school is under-enrolled, um, but they are being put in Fort Howard, which by putting them into Fort Howard, they will over-enroll Fort Howard. It will be over-enrolled. If, even if you look at the schema, you'll see that it is over-enrolled after they take the uh, tank uh, school children. And what happens to those children? Um, they have two options. If you're under two miles, uh, you don't qualify for the bus. But then they say, well, if they're children, we might, you know, we can get the bus. Um, but then if they do get the bus, they're going to have to, for a 20-minute walk, they're going to have to spend at least 40 minutes in the morning, 40 minutes at night, if they're lucky. It's probably going to be an hour and an hour in each time by the time they go and pick up everything else. But if they, if they miss the bus, if they can't, if whatever happens, they don't do that, they have two options. They have to walk on Ashland, which is so dangerous, mm, you know, Ashland, um, Mason Street. If they're worried about middle schoolers crossing the street to, Bear, uh, to Johannes Park, I would be more scared about those little children. And one of the arguments I've heard from is, oh, the moment that one of those middle schoolers <coughs> dies because they were hit by a car, you know, they will be crying. What about when those little elementary school kids get, get hit by a car for walking on these horrible streets? The other one is, the other option is, the, more, the safer option is to go on Broadway. But guess what? Broadway has eight pubs, and I don't know what sex stores, and I don't know how many drug dealers, I don't know what they have, but they have a lot of things going on on, on Broadway, and we're expecting our little elementary school kids to walk through there. I think the, that is why you, don't, you can't just do these things, as Ileana really well said, without looking at everything else. You don't just, they're not just chess pieces that you can move around and say, we're going to move so many people here, so many people there. The other problem that we have with it is transportation. 
And why do we have the problem of transportation? Because number one, it's really hard to get any school bus drivers right now. School bus drivers are, are getting 23, 22, $23 an hour, and they still can't get them. People don't like to do it. It's, very, it's a hard job, and it goes so slow. You have to do all these moves and circles. Um, it's not just that it's hard to get school bus drivers, um, but also what happens for when you do get them, a lot of the school buses, because they are so, uh, they're so scarce, they're overcrowded. They have three kids in, a, in, in one seat. I mean, they do all these things right now because they don't have it. But what does it do to the child? It makes them get up early. As Ileana said, it makes them get up really early, stay, up, uh, stay later in the bus. So they might lose two, three hours just on the bus. It makes it so that they cannot do sports, especially when you have scarcity of school bus drivers. It's not like in the past where you would say, okay, we're gonna get another one to pick you up after you're done with sports. No, they, they barely can get them to take them to school. They're not gonna get them to pick them up from sports or musicals or any other type of enrichment activities or the Boys and Girls Club where they are getting ready for professional activities. All of that is gone for these children. So any solution that is based on busing kids is not a good solution for them. Uh, and especially not for children of working parents because if you have the flexibility or schedule as a mother, as a father to pick up your kids and take them to all these things, that's one thing. But when you have working parents who are working two, three jobs to be able to make sure that their kids can even have the necessary items, it means, as, as Ileana well said, that the older children are doing a lot of the work. That means that they have to, sometimes they're even working to support their family. So you're taking up away 10 hours of their week they're not going to get homework done. They're not going to um, be able to pick up their younger siblings. All of that is going to be problematic. But aside from that, the other thing is those kids are losing their healthy morning walks or healthy afternoon walks. Like all the other K through eights now are going to have all these nice, K, you know, walk to school, back, walk back home. But these kids are going to be cooped up in buses, which means by the time the afternoon comes, they're going to be really exhausted and tired. They're going to get suspended. I know because we've talked to people who have to, who have. Uh, been driving the bus and one of the things that happens is you know if you if they misbehave three times you write them I mean you write them up each time they misbehave three times they're suspended when they're suspended that means they start this trail right that can lead to all kinds of problems dismissal juvenile court who knows what else happens so you can't just dismiss them by saying oh we're gonna just bust them you know that we heard this over and over from the consulting firm the river is nothing we know we're a community where the river is nothing it's nothing if you have the means right it's a lot when you don't you know, when you can't drive when you can't take your ch children to school then it means something so I think when, it, when we look at all of these issues this scheme at 12 has so many layers of problems that it's it, it, it's, I, I can tell you that when we were at West Hyde the other day, someone came up who was white and male. He literally said, I know the money in this in this dis in Green Bay. I know what it's like. And I can tell you what they're doing with, scheme, with this schema is they're taking all the inner city kids and putting them in the kind of in the, I mean, all the children from anywhere, put them in, in the inner cities and making sure you leave everything in the, in the far east or in the far west more white so that, probably so that we don't lose more, more people to the other districts. But we have a population that is growing. The Latino population is here to stay, and as are all the other diverse groups. They're here to stay. They're not going to go away, and they're usually, they um, come with their families. They come, uh, we're, now right now we're seeing the second generation already of people who arrived in the, in the 2000s, and those kids are professionals. They went through the system. And they will say, we're not going to let the next generation suffer through the same things, right? And so they're, going, they're really much opposed to this. So when you ask us what we would like from you is we would really like you to, first of all, study the scheme. It will take a long time, but I think there are now ways to maybe uh, go more clear in that. But put the demographic data on that. And really, we are asking the school board to rethink what they're doing, how they're, how they're impacting so many families in a community that's a majority minority community, a cum community that's well known nationally, and this will attract national attention because we can get it right in Green Bay. We really can, because well, we're also well connected and we can really make a difference. We have to really make sure that we do it right and we spend money on our schools that are diverse and really show what, ha what can happen when communities do this right. That's kind of what I have to say. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you wow. so much <laughs> that, for that compelling speech. I learned so much within those uh, couple of minutes that you were speaking. Um, one of the questions I had um, is, 
What are some solutions? Say they move forward and they don't um, take into consideration, um, you know, postponing the the vote. If they move forward, what are some solutions that you would like for them to do or to have? Um, like transportation, with the school programs, what are some things that you guys are asking for? Well, I think it's hard to move forward when people have not felt included. And this is what, if you would have been there last night, there was a lot of really strong feelings about the lack of inclusion because the facilities task force had, you know, one Latina out of 28, and then it had maybe three uh, people who were diverse and, you know, maybe two people who were African American, one people, one person was Asian, and maybe they had four people, at maximum five, in a district that's 60% diverse, you can't do that, and then say that you've consulted the community. So if we could say something that came up over and over and over yesterday was there was no representation. How can you make decisions for me and say that this represents the community when we, our voices were not heard? The parents really don't, the parents, a lot of parents don't even know what's going on. I mean, I, it's really hard to know what's going on because, like I said, I had to take pictures of all of this. I had to do all this digging to know what's going on. You cannot just easily know what's going on. And, and if they don't have it even in the language of the parents, parents don't know what's going to happen to their children. And they can't get the bird's eye view of what's really happening, you know, how we're moving people, like their little chess pieces to move everybody that's diverse kind of into the inner cities and all of that. You don't see it. And I think it's really problematic. So when you ask what, what we'd like them to do, we'd like them to stop not vote on June 5th because really, truly, they, first of all, they got $94 million just in November. What do they do with that money? Can we please know what happened to all that money? I know yesterday they said, well, it's going to be really more like $400 you know, million that they need, but we'd like to know how they're spending the money they already got. How, what are they doing with that money, number one? But we'd like to also, so they have to stop and get more representation. And then I think the other piece of it is they have to make, they have to really see what's really happening. Start on the west side. The west side is really under enrolled. Don't make the east side kids, especially the kids from the, the near east, pay for what is happening on this side, right? Don't, don't make, if, if, if people really, what's happening is white population is moving out of uh, the district, don't make all the rest of the diverse kids pay for that, right? By, by trying to close their schools, moving them even more, having, busing them and all of that to fill those spaces. That is, that is punishing a population that is actually here, actually c invested in this community. And I think we have to realize, and I think this is really a call to action to say, we have a different, it's a new world here. I mean, the, 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 they can't say, oh, nobody wants to change. They can't accept change. The real change that the Green Bay public schools have to realize is that the community has changed. It is a 60% diverse community is a very different community. It's a community where we have to focus on schools that are really different. And we have to have representation at all levels, right? So what would we like immediately? Immediately, we'd like them to stop the vote until they get more representation be, and develop a schema that has an equity lens. That is what we would like right away. Um, I think that what we would like in the long run is more representation at all levels, right? We would like to have representation in the administration, representation in, among the teachers. There are no representation. You go to East High, which is very strongly diverse, you don't see anything that makes you even think you went into a school that is diverse. I mean, they talk about identity of all the schools. They, they repeatedly talked about community belonging, identity of all the schools. All these diverse schools have, it's like they don't, their identity matters not, right? It's nothing. And they made the Washington and East High the art schools of the region. They should be reflecting the, the beautiful art, the beautiful music of these diverse communities. I mean, they can do amazing things there. Why is that not, why is, are they ignoring what's really there in their faces? It's 60% diverse. Do something really beautiful with that. And that might attract people to the region because then they'll say, yes, look what's happening here. It's unique. It's beautiful. Beautiful, people are artistic, you know, they have all these talents. There's so much you can do. In the long run, there's a lot you can do. In the short run, stop that vote. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that's what we're saying. Stop the vote until there's more representation. Um, yep. Thank you for your information. Um, I think this is a case for this commission to communicate on it. Yeah. Um, uh, May I ask you a question? Were you at the meeting last night? I was not. What was the, the dynamic between the, the board and their consultant? I oh. mean, what, what was the meeting last night? They had two uh, informational meetings, one at West High and one at East High. Okay. 
So what, I'm sorry. What, what was the dynamic between the Board of People and the consultant? Were they looking at the consultant for answers or were they providing words? The board did not speak much, except oh. at the very end, the chair of the board, Lori McCoy, did speak. And oh. uh, very, very briefly at the very end. Um, but it was a very, I mean, really, truly, I hope, I wish more people would have been there. I wish the media would have been there. They were told okay. not to come because they had already been there the day before. But literally, it w they did not have any simultaneous translation. Half of the meeting was in Spanish. I mean, they had a tra one translator for one table. But then people started speaking in Spanish, oh. and they could. So the people who didn't know Spanish couldn't hear because they didn't have a simultaneous translator. Which, if they have a Latino school and thirty percent Latino, they should know. Somebody told me today, oh, you didn't tell us we needed a translator, a, tra a simultaneous, a simultaneous translator. Okay. And I said, you should know by now. <laughs> but the, the, so the, so that by the end of the meeting, Vicky actually cried because she said it was her fault that she had not realized that there was no representation. Vicki is a superintendent. And she apologized to the community for the lack of uh, representation. And she said, it's on me. It's not on the, on the consulting firm. It's on me. And she just said that she, it was her fault that she didn't see the representation. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's on the consulting firm, too. They get paid huge okay. amounts of money to do this. They didn't think to think about the demographics. Um, not in this way. No, they did other things with the demographic. Like I kept talking about the. Is what is the name of the consulting firm? ATS I think I don't know if it was you, but I I heard somebody mention that the, when you go on their yeah. website, there is no mention of equity or anything like that. So they're not like know. specialists in this. Do you know anything about that? I don't know, but I'm sure you could look it up. ATN is hard. But I think um, they are. They have been working with them on something with East High because I saw that they got a, a some kind of a bid for over almost five hundred thousand dollars to work on East High. And I know. Um, I mean, like, there's some other problems. Like they just did, built a, an auditorium in Washington. Not them, but someone built an auditorium for almost four hundred thousand dollars in 2018. Wow, how can they not? How can they say just five years later? Oh, sorry, you know we built this auditorium. Now we're going to have to close the school because it has nooks and crannies. You can't do these kinds do of things. Do you feel like both meetings uh, at the west side and the east? What were some differences, or did you feel there was a difference or not? It was from very the different. The west and east side. I mean, I, that's why I said t yesterday at the meeting on the east side. Probably was the first time that the the board really saw what it means to have a diverse community where people speak in their language and I'm sure in the future if somebody comes and speaks in Somali, someone comes and speaks in Man, they're going to have to know what's going on but they won't know that if they don't have translators. Um, I think that it, it was a very different dynamic. It was really sad because there were people wearing t-shirts, you know, no, no to the, or stop schema 12. And there were people who were professionals and they were treated so badly by the, the firm, they would not let them, speak. anybody who had a t-shirt did not get to speak. I mean, they would just shut people off. They, they did not want us to speak because they were scared of what we would say. But people spoke in Spanish anyway, so, so they got to speak anyway. You know, I, I, I would like to say something. Uh, first of all, Gracia, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, uh, for your comments and for, for, for the information. But, you, and you know, I mean, I think that we're, we're an appointed uh, commission by the mayor to check uh, on equal rights in our community. Uh, I think that the most compelling case to invalidate the recommendation of that uh, consulting firm is exactly what you're saying, the fact that uh, there was not a representation, the admission of the uh, superintendent at the end of uh, just at this meeting that agreed with, with uh, the complaint from, from community members of lack of representation should invalidate the recommendation of this task force and these yeah. consultants yeah. and they should start from scratch. So I don't know if we as a commission, we should call in the, the superintendent, say that there are been members of our community that have come to, to testify in front of this commission and, and we uh, request an explanation. I mean, this is outrageous. That's what uh, I would like yeah. to say. Yeah, I think uh, it would have been, it's unfortunate we can't do an action item tonight uh, because it wasn't on the agenda. Um, because I feel compelled that the time is of the essence and we have to communicate 
I, I believe the notion that people are unaware of the specifics of this plan to the point where they really don't know what's going on is accurate. I think they're pushing this too fast, mm -hmm. let alone too broad. <laughs> yeah. Overwhelmingly. Uh, so a call for pause is a, a smart thing to do, especially in light of what we've, we've heard. I don't know, I guess we don't meet until after this June 5th. I don't know if we have to potentially call a special meeting. So I'm just going to intervene um, real quick. Um, we will, Stephanie and I will have a uh, strategy session with um, with Joe to make sure that um, it's within our, within our scope of the ERC. Um, but we have been having ongoing conversations on this and okay. yeah, so we'll share that with you um, a little bit more, but that's, that is a good um, point. Okay. And the reason I'm bringing it up now uh, during discussion is because of the time frame. Yes. Um, and it's almost as quickly, I mean, the, they met last night, and we're talking about it now, and we find we don't have time for the next meeting. I mean, that's just way too fast. I mean, just, um, it it's just seems to me way too fast. Uh, John, we have some answers? So I think um, we've got this forum at Washington on May 24th, right? So, as individual commissioners, there's no problem with open meetings or anything if we're all there. No, I do think though, it, if it's um, if people plan on going, then we could always put a notice um, just in case that there might be a quorum mm -hmm. at a public event like that. Okay. That'd be the only thing. But yeah, there's no issue with that. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, number one, I plan to write a personal letter as uh, an individual commissioner. Um. Uh, I, I would recommend um, writing it as a resident of the state of Green Bay. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, okay. Um, I'll, I'm going to write a letter as an individual <laughs> citizen in Green Bay and also a professor at UW Green Bay and uh, president of my union and a bunch of other things, but maybe I won't put Equal Rights Commissioner. Right. Um, but certainly when I go and speak there, I can reference the fact that I know something about the Equal Rights Commission. We do know something. We yeah. might mention that. Um, so, you know, I think anybody who felt compelled to do the same thing could also do that. Um, if we're, I mean, if we're being charitable, right, like this is a, this is a, this is why representation matters, right? I mean, how many Latinos are on the school board? <laughs> I know that's an answer. I know everybody knows the answer to that, but, you know, like if there had been one Latino who had been parent parent of somebody who went to Washington or East High School, they would they would know why this is a, a problem, right? This is why lived experience is really important. And so if we're being charitable about, about this, we could just say, hey, this is this is why like representation matters and you need a, a, a better uh, process for this. And so if you're the school district, how, maybe I'm wrong about this, but like how could you not postpone this? I mean it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. So um, I guess my question is, you know, I certainly can uh, also ask people in my network to sign on to a letter, but are there things that we can do as a commission to encourage other citizens in Green Bay to talk about this? I think it's important. Am I allowed to, am I allowed to ask that question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Stephanie and I had this conversation earlier, um, and due to the um, the issue of not having enough translators at the two round tables that the school board um, had. We thought it'd be um, really beneficial to host a open forum for community members. Um, and I also spoke to Maud that um, they could possibly fund a few translators for us for that open, open forum. Um, but um, there's still more discussions to be had. Um, but it would be a fast turnover rate. It would have to have it would have to happen next week before the 24th. But that's a meeting that you could call as chair, exactly. right? And and we could invite school board members to come to that meeting if they wanted to. Right. And what we hope to that that effect would have is that um, it's coming from us, so we would be a safe space rather. Than, yep. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I, I want to echo what John was saying earlier. Um, 
I really encourage everyone as residents of Green Bay to um, reach out to NULET, um, whether it's Grazia, um, Stephanie, or Ileana, mm -hmm. and learn more about the situation um, and about the schema plan and how you can um, support those communities that are being affected by it. Is there a um, way to connect with NULET, uh, like a website or maybe a number or something? They, they, they could probably uh, reach my number if they'd like or to. Or email. Oh, we have an email. Okay. Yeah, let me get the email. So actually, Amanda shared the email. Oh, oh she did. Right. And then they can also call Casava. Amanda would be like the person that has yeah. everything together. You're like, you can, she has staff and everything, so that would yes. be great. Yes, yes. So Amanda said the best way to reach out is email. So the email is new dot l a t i n o dot education at gmail dot com. Again, that's n e w like new. <laughs> yep. <laughs> dot latino dot education at gmail dot com. So new lat yeah, new dot latino dot education yes. at gmail dot com. Perfect. Thank you. You know. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That was really helpful. Um, do we have any other questions that we'd like to ask um, Gracia or Ileana or have any other comments? I feel like we're going to be talking very soon. Hopefully <laughs> we'll be seeing each other as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Really thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So can I get a motion? If there's no other further comments or questions, then I'll have to ask for a motion to close the floor. So moved. Second. All right, so all in favor, please say aye. 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 All not in favor or all opposed, please say nay. Nay. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I was thinking, sorry. I was thinking nay, I don't want to get Floor's closed. Um, so thank you, commissioners. Um, and, you know, I, I really, like I said earlier, encourage you to reach out and um, see how you can support in this situation. Um, so moving forward, um, there's a few little housekeeping things that I wanted to share with the group. One, I still need um, the bios from a few of our members. I, we really want to update the website, so I'd like to get your bios and if you're comfortable, your photo. Um, we'd like to update that as soon as possible. Um, secondly, Joe sent out um, an email with a parking flyer. If you guys would like to park for free in the parking lot during our meetings, please fill that out and send them back to Joe. Um, and then um, next is the time of the meeting. Does 5.30 work for everyone or is that, I, I know you know people usually don't get off to 5 or 5.30, so is, is that time cutting it too close to your, your work time? Should we move it to 6 p.m.? 5.30 is good. You guys feel okay with 5.30? Um, Commissioner Ortiz, Commissioner Hassan, you guys are okay with 5.30? Well, if you move to six, you don't have to worry about the parking pass. That's true. <laughs> Although I enjoy trying to dig up 40 cents every time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I heard Commissioner Hassan said that time was good too. So we're going to keep it at 5.30. But if there's any issues, please feel free to reach out and we'll, we'll re-evaluate um, re that time. And then the last thing, um, the, the Hmong American... Um, I mean, Hmong Lao American Day is happening this weekend, um, May 14th, Sunday, May 14th, at the Neville, Neville Museum. I think they're going to have like food carts and things, activities to do, so please join if you guys are able to. I'm not part of the planning committee, but if you guys want more information, I can try to connect you to the May 14th? May, Sunday, May 14th. Yeah. Um, that's all that I had for the updates. Do you have a time on that? True. Uh, 1 to 5 p.m., thank you. But yeah, that's all I had for my chair update. Um, I'd like to ask if any commissioners have any announcements, anything that you guys want to share? Um, on September 16th at UWGB, there's going to be a Estamos Aquí Festival, and it's celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month and also the, the community that lives in Brown County that is Latino or Hispanic. Um, and they invited us at the board, so we should be getting an email soon so that we could also go there and just enjoy some of the flavors, sounds that the community brings to Green Bay. So Amazing. September 16th, AWGB. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there yeah. anything we could do there of like, hey, we're the Equal Rights Commission, oh, yeah. like a table or something? Is that possible? Yes, 100%. We should do We that. could do a speech, a booth, whatever we want. Yeah, we should do something like that. Yep. Maybe not everybody can be there, but yep. 
they reached out they want involvement from the commission so however we want to discuss that we can just let them know and we're, we're in okay well count me in yeah so, absolutely let us know how we can support and help awesome yeah and be saeed has uh, and christina you guys as well <laughs> okay any other announcements comments discussions all right so if there's nothing further um can i get a motion to adjourn the meeting uh, Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Okay, the meeting is adjourned. You didn't want to oppose that one, Stephanie. Uh, no, no. Thank you. Thank you so much.